Good morning, I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I'd like to welcome you to our forum on mobile entrepreneurship around the world. And we are webcasting this event live, so uh, we'd like to welcome our viewers from around the country and outside of the United States. We will be archiving the video from this event, uh, so anybody who wishes to view it after today will, will have an opportunity to do so through our brookings.edu uh, website. We also welcome any comments and questions that you have. Uh, we have set up a Twitter uh, feed uh, with a, uh, the hashtag TechCTI, that's TechCTI, so if you wish to post comments during the forum, uh, or ask questions, uh, we would uh, be happy to have you uh, do so. And during our audience Q&A segment, we will take questions both from our live audience as well as the virtual audience. So today, we are releasing a new paper entitled, How Mobile Technology is Driving Global Entrepreneurship. And copies of the paper are out in the hallway uh, or available online at brookings.edu. Entrepreneurship is crucial for economic development around the globe. In places such as Nigeria, uh, Egypt, and Indonesia, it is estimated that micro-entrepreneurs generate 38% of gross domestic uh, product. Mobile devices provide opportunities for entrepreneurs to overcome the challenges of doing uh, business in developing nations. Mobile phones empower women and the disadvantaged. They allow uh, businesses to access market information and they help small entrepreneurs sell products across broader geographic areas, reach new customers, and also utilize mobile payment uh, systems. There was an interesting survey uh, recently by Time Magazine and Qualcomm of over 4,000 people in eight different countries. And what the survey found was that 93% of those polled believe that wireless mobile technology is important for entrepreneurship, 81% uh, said that it helped them search for the lowest available prices. 78% felt that it gave them access to a larger group of customers. And 63% believe that it strengthened the economy in their home country. And we think that uh, mobile devices are especially helpful to women and the disadvantaged. Uh, they often don't have access to venture capital or startup funding, so it's difficult for them to get enterprises off the ground. And wireless communications can help broaden their reach and give them access to bigger geographic areas and help them overcome some of the barriers they face in terms of uh, technology, capital access, and societal restrictions on women in uh, some of those uh, places. Uh, the forum today is part of a three-year mobile economy uh, project. Uh, previously, we have done events on mHealth, mCampaigning, and other aspects of uh, mobile and broadband development. Uh, we appreciate the generous financial support that Qualcomm has provided uh, for this uh, project. To help us understand the benefits and barriers to mobile entrepreneurship around the world, we have brought together an outstanding set of speakers this morning. Alex Counts is the president and CEO of uh, Grameen, is that how you pronounce it? Grameen Foundation. Grameen Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps the poor escape poverty using microfinance and technology. Uh, he founded Grameen in 1997 after a decade of work in microfinance uh, and poverty reduction. After graduating from Cornell, he studied as a Fulbright Scholar in Bangladesh, where he trained under Dr. Muhammad uh, Yunus, the founder and managing uh, director of Grameen uh, Bank, and a co-recipient of the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. Alex is the author of Small Loans, Big Dreams, how uh, Nobel Prize winner Muhammad uh, Yunus and microfinance are changing the world. Mwangi Kamini is director of the African Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution. That is part of the foreign policy uh, program uh, here. He is a senior fellow and uh, director of the Africa Growth Initiative and a research associate with the Center for the Study of African uh, uh, Economies uh, from the University of Oxford. He is the founding executive director of the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis 
And uh, there he focused on Africa's development, including institutions for economic growth, political economy, and private sector development. He is the recipient of various honors and awards, including being the co-winner of the Outstanding Research Award by the Global Development Network. He also has authored or co-edited seven different books, six policy monographs, and has published widely in various journals and books. And to my immediate uh, right is Brooke Partridge, Partridge, who is the president and CEO of Vital Wave Consulting, a company that seeks to advance emerging markets. Uh, before joining uh, Vital Wave, uh, Brooke was the business director of the Emerging Market Solutions Organization at HP, where she built a team that designed and commercialized HP's first technology uh, solutions for developing economies. She has lived and worked around the world, including Peru, uh, Chile, Mexico, India, Africa, and Western Europe. And she has uh, been featured and quoted in publications such as the Huffington Post, uh, The Economist, and uh, The New York Times. So uh, Brooke, I will uh, start with uh, you. Uh, how is uh, mobile influencing entrepreneurship at different levels of the global economy? Um, I think it's safe to say that mobile is um, at the lowest ends of the global economy, not just um, helping entrepreneurship, it's actually allowing it to happen in many cases. It's actually enabling entrepreneurship uh, in many cases for the first time um, because of the reach, obviously, that it provides and the communication that it allows. Um, in, in many cases, through very simple um, use of voice and text, um, it, it enables um, taxi drivers to uh, find you know, more clients. It enables uh, service providers, which is a big part of the sort of um, uh, business of lower income individuals in the developing world providing labor and service. They are able to connect more easily and readily with business opportunities as day laborers. Um, but there's also the more um, a, a multi-layered impact of mobile in the developing world, especially for entrepreneurship, as it's creating opportunities for um, for entrepreneurs who actually create services through the mobile phone, app developers, for instance, who are creating services that can be used by other entrepreneurs in the developing world. So there's a multi-layered impact that it can actually have. Um, it, um, it, it's also enabling, I mean, I think it's important to note that it enables entrepreneurship across almost every industry. You mentioned this, the panel that you had recently on M Health, uh, M Health, M Finance, um, and learning um, are all areas that are growing quickly and, and being aided and are aiding entrepreneurs and also creating entrepreneurs. There's a, a great um, uh, initiative called MAMA, the Mobile Alliance for Maternal Action that's <laughs> funded by Johnson and Johnson and, um, and USAID and the UN Foundation, the M Health Alliance. Um, they're out helping entrepreneurs in the developing world who are creating M Health applications that that provide information to um, expectant and new mothers, um, and so they're actually stimulating because mobile is available. They're stimulating entrepreneurship that is then having secondary impact in terms of helping maternal and child health. So mobile is having impact um, for entrepreneurship on on many levels. Okay, uh, thank you. So Alex, you help the poor escape poverty using microfinance and technology. How do wireless devices affect poverty alleviation? Yeah. First of all, I just want to congratulate you, Daryl, on this paper that you've come out with, uh, which I read earlier this morning, and I highly recommend it's something that's short and chock full of facts and ideas and data and not that much jargon. Um, <laughs> And also, in this day and age, to be able to wrestle any piece of thought leadership to the ground while, and get it out while it's still relevant is actually a big accomplishment. So uh, congratulations. Um, Grameen Foundation um, has been working actually for 11 years in how the mobile phone can be a poverty alleviation accelerator, uh, long before we knew that there would be 5 billion phones in the developing world, which is the case today. Uh, and so we've learned some lessons, as much from things that have not worked as things that have worked. And I just want to kind of summarize those lessons and then give you two concrete examples just to kick it off. Uh, I think one of our lessons is that technology is usually the easy part of making technology work for the poor. Um, and what are the more hard parts are often about 
how do you have frontline people that cover the last mile that actually can help the poor and the organizations that work with and benefit from technology. It requires a lot of agility. What, what works in Uganda doesn't necessarily work in Kenya. What works in 2009 doesn't necessarily work in 2010. Um, it requires deep relationships with mobile network operators who are themselves often going through big swings of profitability and then uh, disruption. Um, and it requires a, a real level of accountability uh, that just to throw mobile phones over the wall and, and assume that they're going to benefit the poor without building in accountability mechanisms to see that how they're benefiting and that they are benefiting uh, is a recipe for uh, uncertain outcomes. So, um, and so let me just take you through our work in East Africa and then maybe a little bit in Indonesia. We, uh, in 2002, we took a program that had been wildly successful in Bangladesh, the village phone program where women were set up, ultimately 300,000 to have mobile pay phones uh, as a business. We took that to Uganda, uh, initially messed it up pretty well, uh, and it really didn't realize that just throwing the phone over the wall, as I'd said, they worked pretty well in Bangladesh, didn't work so well in Uganda, needed some re-engineering. But we got, we got it right. Uh, ultimately, 80,000 Ugandan women microfinance clients, so most of them uh, benefited. Uh, we sold our interest in that kind of uh, social enterprise and started something similar in Rwanda. But then we realized it was a dying business. As everyone got their own phones, pay phones were less valuable. So then we said, why don't we use the data possibilities of the phone and put up a bunch of information that you can get through a very basic phone in three domains, health, agriculture, and commerce. And what we found, skipping a lot of learnings, but the final learning through a third party study was that putting really relevant information in those domains on the phones in two languages um, increased knowledge, but didn't change behaviors, which was kind of the holy grail. So rather than be excited about the, the knowledge change, we said, how do you actually, when we pick one domain, agriculture, how do we really drive to the behavior change piece? Um, and, we, and so we, we expanded the uh, information available through agriculture, but we actually had one farmer in each community of now about 1,000 communities in uh, Uganda who became an expert on how do you actually get the right information at the right time with the right uh, images to the farmer uh, in their community that can actually help them improve their yields, get a better price, uh, adopt better practices. And what we found uh, is that, um, uh, that by doing that, by having that person covering the last mile to help contextualize the information, we actually finally saw behavior change. We saw farmers adopting better practices, at, but over two years doubling uh, adoption of good practices, and also getting significantly higher prices uh, for their crops uh, compared to a control group. So we had a IFPRI uh, actually did the study for us. So we felt, we felt finally a bit satisfied, um, but well, I'm sure there'll be some other disruption that will send us to have to innovate more, but we're really pleased with that uh, outcome. Uh, and, um, the other thing that was interesting is we said, do we charge for this mobile agricultural extension? So we said initially no, um, but what we learned was, and this is another piece of what we feel the opportunity is, is that we along the way realized that having these enumerators out there that could serve as enumerators, these what we call community knowledge workers, which were pure farmers, 60% of which own, earn less than $1.25 a day, but they have a little more education, can read English uh, and understand English uh, on their phones. Uh, through the database, uh, they were actually in a position to conduct surveys in their communities of farmers and actually gather information uploaded in real time on their phone. And there were a lot of organizations, international organizations and businesses in Kampala that were willing to pay for that information. So that became an income source. We paid them for doing these surveys, which actually helps bridge the information gap between uh, the central, the capital and the businesses and the government there and what's actually going on in the rural areas. For lack of that information, a lot of business does not get done with the, the bottom of the pyramid uh, population. Also, we gave them a solar charging solution, which they were very entrepreneurial and began to, uh, it could not only charge their phone, but phones of people in their community. Uh, and they were now earning a dollar or two dollars a day in additional income without even charging for the agricultural extension, which they did as a kind of pro bono service. So 
So we had a lot of learnings uh, and, some, uh, and some satisfying accomplishments. In Indonesia, uh, uh, I'll maybe get into that a little later, but we more did a mobile micro uh, franchise play that was with our partner Ruma that is mentioned in the paper. Um, and where we saw that by empowering uh, village entrepreneurs, and, and that whole project was the, that was the originated in uh, another, uh, an idea that was totally wrong in terms of its assumptions, but we, we innovated and changed our model and it was a partnership with Qualcomm, who's a great partner, especially when things don't turn out like you think they're gonna turn out and you need to change on a dime. I guess they've learned that from their business. Um, but ultimately what we found is by empowering uh, now about 12,000 uh, village entrepreneurs to sell airtime in tiny increments in their community, as much as 10 cents is what people want, and they want it in that small increment, and they want it locally, uh, that we found that the margins that the village entrepreneurs could earn on airtime sales from their phone to another with a special application could take 40% of those entrepreneurs um, uh, who were below the poverty line when they started that business, and 40% of them within six months earned enough margin on their airtime sales to cross the poverty line, which is a lot faster progress than we see in traditional microfinance or, or a, lot of, um, a lot of different social enterprises. So anyway, I could go more into those areas. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it here. And we will, shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, Mwangi, uh, you direct the Brookings Africa Growth Initiative. So what opportunities do you see for M entrepreneurship in developing nations? Uh, thank you very much. I also appreciated reading the paper, which uh, has, is quite detailed and uh, easy to go through, but with the relevant information. Yeah. Um, I, I, I found uh, I, this topic of mobile technology is very, I'm very passionate about it and uh, I see it as uh, one way that Africa especially or the poorest countries can leapfrog development. It has provided us many opportunities and uh, in fact we could not have imagined the trajectories that we are able to achieve uh, these days. Um, I, I come from Kenya and uh, in Kenya, you know, I think anything, if you talk to uh, even the uh, those people who have not gone to school, uh, or very basic education, they will tell you a lot about what they do with their mo mobile technologies, mobile phone. Uh, just as an example, I can, from here, from Washington, I can take money from one bank account in Kenya, transfer it to another bank account, transfer money to my own, uh, uh, to convert money to electronic money, send it to someone in Kenya, pay some airtime for someone else within five minutes. I can do all that sitting from my office, and it would cost me, you know, for every maybe transaction about uh, less than a dollar. Uh, if you compare that with the uh, transactions like, uh, uh, like uh, Western Union or anything, it's incredibly uh, cheap and, and very, very important for us. Now, uh, the way I would like to look at it from, in terms of entrepreneurship is thinking about why is it that we have, particularly for developing countries, that at, we, we get a lot of problems in terms of uh, entrepreneurship. What are the constraints to, uh, to this entrepreneurship? And they are actually, if you look at, break down everything, you find that it's either due to uh, government failures or actual market failures uh, that actually constrain entrepreneurship. Then we think about backwards and see how do these mobile technologies help us resolve these government failures and, uh, and, and also the market failures. And the way I see it in terms of opportunities, the first one is really, and where we have really exploited the, the, these mobile technologies, is on information. Uh, just, you know that you know, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship is difficult when you don't have information. We are, they, are, they, are, they are major, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, market, market failures because of lack of information or the way the, mar the market is, uh, the information is transmitted in terms of speed or in terms of availability. But the, the, f the first thing that we know about mobile technologies is that they help us communicate information very fast to distant places, remote areas where you don't even have any other form of infrastructure like roads or uh, landlines and so on. So I think that's one of the areas that has been uh, crucial in terms of uh, solving the, uh, the market failures as, that uh, hinders um, uh, business operations uh, and so on. I think the other one that is also important has to do with government failures. Uh, we know that there are a lot of problems with governments in our countries that uh, constrain how people operate businesses. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are so many operations right now that deal with how to improve the efficiency of government. Um, and just to, to give a few examples, for example, in, in Kenya and Nigeria, 
there is already a platform in the, uh, in the mobile phone in some of these countries where if you are going to start a business and you get problems setting up a license or you ask to pay a bribe, you can just set uh, uh, information uh, that uh, you are required to pay some uh, bribe and uh, you will get a response uh, to give the information ab about that. So when these people know that uh, issuing a license is supposed to be free and then someone is asking for a bribe and there is communication that can reach the, the authorities, uh, usually you are, you are able to deal with this. We are, we are using the mobile technologies also to deal with violence. Uh, in the, as you know, in Kenya we had the election of violence in 2007, 2008, and the, what's going on now, there's already a platform, mobile-based platform, where people can record incidences of preparation of violence, and this transmitted to, to the headquarters, there's a map of potential uh, violence and so on. So it, since we are, we are here under governance studies, I think one of the areas innovations about mobile technologies is creating a good environment for people to do business, for entrepreneurship, uh, because now there's more information and they, they saw that. Now, so far as we know, and what we have seen in, in many, many of these countries, and looking about like the issue of financial inclusion, uh, we talked about the poor and finances and, and so on. There's still, we know now there's a lot of opportunity to exploit the mobile technologies still. We started with money transfer. That has been perfected now, so, so to say. But we have now gone to another stage or sort of second generation where now we need better in innovations and, and uh, that we can take advantage is going to the savings, saving the insurance, going to the insurance, which is already being practiced, but they need to be scaled up a little bit so that there are, there are many opportunities. I think one of the areas that I have seen, again, using the example of Nairobi about opportunities, is that um, people have realized that this small mobile phone has, can be, you have the technology, but there's so much that can be done with. So one of the, 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 the outcome has been new innovation laboratories. There are uh, uh, incubation laboratories now, and I counted last time I was in Nairobi, I visited like five of them, where they are being set up by businesses, they are giving them funds just to look at what you can do with these mobile phones. And this is a great opportunity for young people, where they are really testing, coming up with ideas, some of them coming up, looking at what problems are entrepreneurs facing. One is security, for example. And I know someone has sent an application that, uh, that can track the movement of security guards and for them to actually uh, report anything that they are going and connect it with the police and so on. So I think um, there, there are many opportunities and we could talk about even the health area and the farm area, the, um, uh, the, you know, using weather, you know, like now we know we are, there, are, there are platforms where they are using weather insurance mm -hmm. through the mobile form again. So there are so many opportunities that we can use. We just need to understand how we communicate this. And I guess the big problem has been something works in a small community, but scaling it up is not automatic that it will, be, it will work in every other place. But there are many, many opportunities for uh, using the mobile technologies for development. Okay, uh, so with Brooke and Alex, I want to follow up on uh, a point that Mwangi uh, just uh, made in terms of, he was mentioning that the constraints on uh, M entrepreneurship uh, generally arise from government and, and or market failures and just the need for information uh, that comes out of that. So I'm curious uh, for each of you, uh, what are the barriers that you uh, see to M entrepreneurship and how can we overcome them? And Brooke, we'll start with you. Um, so uh, three or four main categories come to mind and just to, to start with a, a comment on Mwangi's examples, which are so fantastic. Kenya is an amazing, hotbed of, of M services and, and, and use of mobile and entrepreneurship, and it's largely because of M-Pesa. Because of the peer-to-peer -peer money transfer system that has become ubiquitous in the country, it's become a platform for developing other types of services. And the challenge is that other countries have not been able to duplicate that same scale of M-Pesa because of government issues, because of market pressures. A lot of what made M-Pesa or allowed in PESA to scale is that it was, it was um, underestimated, right? The government didn't think it was gonna be something big. The banking industry in Kenya didn't pay attention to it and it took off. It was an amazing business model. It was a service that was definitely needed. Safaricom, Vodafone invested in it and they made it happen. Um, 
but it's not been replicated in any other countries, yet there's been a lot of, of, of intention, even in, even Safaricom, and MPESA, there's been attempts to, to, to duplicate M-Pesa in other countries. So what's happening is the government gets involved and starts putting regulations around it, and that's you know, for good reasons, but it's also inhibiting the scale, the banking industry's concerned because they feel that they're missing out on some of their own market. And, uh, but what you're seeing in Kenya is a tremendous growth of other, uh, of, of other services. You mentioned several of them. Uh, Chimganka is, is one, a really great service that uses M-Pesa that allows um, uh, families to save for the birth of their child so that they actually, it's, it's essentially insurance, it's essentially uh, medical insurance for, for childbirth. Um, it's just one of many, many examples, the, the weather insurance for crops, um, all enabled through M-Pesa. I, I will say though that there are other challenges aside from just having this kind of foundational platform available like like peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, um, finding scalable, business models or planning from, for scale from the mm. very beginning is a huge best practice that is difficult. A lot of these applications are started by people who see a local immediate problem, an issue that can be solved through a pretty straightforward application, and so they create that application and that's fantastic. They're solving the local problem. Then the question comes up, well, if this problem exists in many other places, why can't we scale up this solution? The issue is the solution technically and from a business perspective operationally was not necessarily designed initially for scale and so people spend a lot of time trying to trying to expand pilots that were never intended to grow in the first place they really need to either start with a plan for scale or actually kind of go back to the drawing board and redesign the solution not throwing away what they've learned they've learned a lot through the pilot um, and those learnings can be applied to a new implementation but the pilot itself rarely successfully scales without that in mind in the first place. Okay, Alex, uh, what are the barriers that you see and how can we overcome them? Well, certainly government policies um, are a, a key issue. Some of these issues, I mean, related to know your customer requirements, privacy, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism, um, to name a few. Um, they're in the process of being worked out, but many countries are, op are working them out very differently, which is gonna create its own problems. Um, so there's, there's a big public policy agenda. Uh, second, I think the mobile um, financial services possibilities are, even in Kenya, are we've only really hit the tip of the iceberg and I'm, I'm not entirely confident that we're actually going to get far beyond that without a concerted effort. Uh, really what's been, ha what's, what the innovation has been around payments, which is important, but the possibility of the mobile phone to facilitate uh, borrowing, saving, insurance is is really under you is is underexplored. Uh, where we've uh, in a next in a neighbor to Kenya and Uganda, we've started with the Gates Foundation and CGAP and uh, Barclays uh, a mobile money uh, incubator and then an accelerator to take the best ideas that shows you know, and that are built for scale from the outset. Uh, we're excited about it. We're applying some of the same approaches, the iterative learning approaches that we've applied to the kind of village phone and CKW, but it's, you know, we're, we're not there yet. Um, the other two barriers I see are, number one, just is a very simple one, charging solutions, power, electricity. Um, we've been promised solar charging solutions that work. Uh, we've really found very few that actually work more than about six months or a year before they start breaking down. Uh, so if someone can nail that, or if someone has and we haven't found them yet, please send them my way. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, and, and, and again, the, the, um, and the grid electricity has its own, you know, limitations. And, and lastly, there's a huge issue, which goes to the scale question, of interoperability. Um, so a huge amount of one-off solutions that are not built for scale or to interface with other solutions. Um, we see this particularly in the mobile health field where we've been working in Ghana and India. Um, and certainly health is a key issue, a secondary issue to entrepreneurship. Uh, if you're not healthy, if you're afflicted by health crisis, your business is not going to work if it's a small family business. But the, the era of let a thousand flowers bloom in terms of mobile health and other mobile solutions, if it was ever appropriate, I think it's not appropriate anymore. These systems need to be able to talk to each other, and that's part of a larger issue, that, as Brooke mentioned, of, of, building, of building these solutions for scale from the outset, and, and that's, that's something that I think has not been the norm so far. 
So Milwaukee, uh, several uh, uh, times people have mentioned uh, Kenya us now. Mm -hmm. Since you're an expert on uh, development in Africa, I was wondering if you could compare and contrast the Kenya approach to that of other countries with an eye towards helping us understand what are the barriers and you know what are some of the countries doing wrong and what should they be doing that might enable more progress? <laughs> Thank you. Actually, it's been a very difficult question to answer because every time uh, someone is asking, you know, why is it working in Kenya and it's not working in, in other countries? And uh, I remember the former CEO of Safaricom saying that uh, Kenyans have peculiar ways. Uh, for example, on Friday afternoons, it's very difficult to get a call through. Uh, everybody, I, for some reason, everybody seems to be waiting the whole week and then they all are calling on Friday and, you know, the networks are crowded. Uh, so he was talking about, uh, he was, instead of saying he has a mechanical or technical problem, he was saying the Kenyans' peculiar ways of, of calling. But anyway, uh, there are several issues, I think. Uh, Kenya was lucky in this case. Uh, one, as, as, as Brooke says, that it seems that M-Pesa was underestimated. Uh, there was real opposition, particularly by the bankers, when they realized that it's growing. Because they, they said, first of all, you cannot handle money without a banking license. You, are not, you cannot take money unless you go and get a banking license. How are they receiving money and transacting with money? And actually, uh, this, you know, so this was an issue. But they said, you know, they are not doing any banking. They are just like converting money from uh, paper money or uh, real money to electronic money and then uh, transferring it. So it was not uh, banking. Uh, then you had a, a new change. In t I think leadership matters. We had a real difference in terms of the central bank governor, who was, by the way, one of the people I've had uh, hired when I was at uh, my former institute, uh, and, and he understood this issue and took on it. Then we had a regulator, uh, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Telecommunication, we had a new permanent secretary who had started in the U.S., had done a degree on technology, ICT, and he understood what this could do, and he was able to convince the president even when there was a real opposition by the bankers. By the time uh, the bankers started to organize, they, are, they, they had moved on. But apart from that, I think Kenya has also some other advantages. I tried to look at Nigeria, and I was asking why is it, we had a, a similar forum in, with Citibank, and uh, we were in Abidjan at that time, but we were asking, you know, why is this not happening as much in Nigeria? And there are many countries that have issues. One is that you really need uh, to do a lot of these mobile-based techn technology transactions, you also need a good system of national identification. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many countries where they don't have a national ID, some uh, even religious, I think there are some places where they don't uh, register, so they don't have IDs. You need a, a real system of, uh, of identification. The other one is really the capacity. I think you really need the capacity to regulate. Uh, some of these mobile technologies that we're using can actually destabilize the entire monetary uh, system. Uh, if you don't know what you are doing, you really, you re it's not just letting it go. Uh, a lot of the countries, particularly in Africa, do not have real capacity to regulate mm -hmm. without controlling. Uh, you know, in other words, measured regulation that allow them to work and at the same time uh, not, not constrain the, the, the innovations and so on. But uh, there, there has to be something else uh, that we haven't really figured out. And we, there are people now trying to do randomized experiments. I know my colleague is doing some randomized experiments to see why mm -hmm. uh, some communities are, adopt or others are not co adopting what, what is in it. So we really don't have an answer. Maybe that's where some of the areas that we really need to explore further to see where we go. Uh, beyond this, and, and we've been trying to answer some of those questions. Um, but uh, but they are, they are, the issue in terms of the big constraints, uh, I think interoperability is big. Uh, in Kenya, we have right now six mobile companies, uh, uh, telecom companies, each its own system, but they don't talk to each other. And you cannot even transact uh, you know, between them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that becomes a big uh, constraint uh, in terms of uh, the, the big, the, the, the national, at the national level. Daryl, can I add something sure. to that just Go quickly? Ahead. I was in Kenya, just I'm no expert on Kenya, but I was there three weeks ago and I asked this question, why um, was the uptake so large here? And one of the things that people, a couple of people said, so uh, not scientific, but people said Kenyans and East Africans in general have a, a tendency to be open to new ways of doing things. Um, and so uh, apart from anything else, we're just willing to say, let's transact you know, money on our phone, and why not? Let's give it a, give it a whirl. Um, and the other thing that was kind of interesting about also the, the regulators 
We were with uh, Grameen Foundation. We've made a, a modest investment in the world's first cashless microfinance institution called Musoni, based in Kenya. So it does not, in any no, it, no, it does not touch cash in any of its ways that it operates. Um, and they were applying for a banking license. And interesting, in like many countries, I suppose, to open up a bank branch in Kenya, you have to have a, a strong room to, in order to actually keep the cash safe. Mm -hmm. Well, when you don't have any cash, um, <laughs> that's not such a good investment, probably. Um, so we were meeting with some of the women in the COO, and he was off to visit the central bank officials to make the case that could they grant a waiver. And you know, I don't know how, I don't think it's been resolved yet, but he uh, was thinking of it with a sense of optimism, like the Kenyan central bankers, they'll probably see the logic of what we're doing, and it may take a few weeks, but we think we'll get the waiver. That in a lot of countries I've been in, sometimes the very one that I'm sitting in today, um, the government's ability to grant waivers and see logic and let kind of these things mm -hmm. evolve, uh, I haven't seen in much evidence. But in Kenya, that's, there seemed to be a sense of optimism that the regulators will, will you, can, you can kind of dialogue with them. I'm glad somebody's looking ahead. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, last question I want to pose to our panel, and then we'll open the floor to uh, questions from the audience, is to ask each of you to kind of look two to three years ahead, just in terms of new developments or new innovations that are starting to come online or that offer promise of being transformative. Like, what are you seeing, Brooke? Yeah, um, along you referenced it a minute ago. It's M identity. It's, it's the ability mm. to authenticate mm. people on the yeah. phone so that you can have more secure transactions or more sophisticated transactions. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a new area that organizations like the GSM Association are just starting to work on and they're forming working groups. Uh, my firm, Vital Wave, we have a very concerted effort to be understanding and helping to drive the thought process around M identity. But we've been saying and thinking for years that it would be a linchpin for a new level of M services, um, especially in the developing world. And so, yeah, that would be a place where I'd, I'd, I'd keep an eye out. Okay, Alex. Well, I think to you know piggyback on a point I made earlier, the further exploring the mobile financial services um, possibilities beyond payments is is certainly we hope to go there. Uh, second of all, I think there are a lot of kind of e-governance um, uh, possibilities, um, and uh, I remember uh, without going into the story too much. Uh, in Rwanda, um, where there was so much, I remember a woman pulled me aside when we were launching Village Phone there, and she pulled me aside and said, um, you know, we wish we'd had these phones in our communities during the genocide, mm -hmm. because we were getting all of these wrong, mm -hmm. kind of uh, violence-inducing messages through the radio. I wish we could have had phones to call into the radio stations and get on the air and tell them that those are wrong, but it was only one-way communication. So again, not sure exactly that would have how that would have worked, but it was, it was interesting that that was her insight. But lastly, and, and this is a, an insight from what, from what we've, the survey work we've been doing, as I said earlier, these community knowledge workers uh, doing, doing a, a baseline survey of every farmer in their community, uploading it instantaneously into a database through their phone with GPS, so it shows exactly where it is, and then doing regular monthly surveys on a contract basis. It's kind of created a vision for us uh, in two or three years of, you know, in the, in the international development industry working on poverty, our M&E systems are atrocious. Um, and even those that have tried to do it, they don't speak to each other. So it's this interoperability question. And I think you know, we could actually set it up so that the monitoring and evaluation arm of the international movement to end poverty is actually poor people in those communities who are trained to use a phone and use simple tools like our progress out of poverty index to actually tell us whether what we're doing is working and moving the dial and letting them get paid for it um, and do it at much less cost. And again, if we can agree on some basic protocols in terms of data standards, um, you know, what we could have is A, for the first time, most of the resources being trained on poverty uh, being can follow actually results rather than reputation and relationships, which is how most of them get allocated now. Uh, and also, in that M&E effort, get the poor paid for it. Um, and so that's a, kind of an exciting vision that we're, you know, again, starting to take some steps in that direction. I, I won't say we're, we're there yet, um, but we see the possibilities of it um, based on our work, especially in, in Uganda and Kenya, and Uganda and Indonesia. Uh, so, Malangi, what are you watching for over the next two or three years? So, uh, uh, first of all, I think the way the, the, this is really a sort of... Uh, 
a geometric growth mm -hmm. in the changes and the way it is. And I can tell you, if we sit here three years from now, uh, the things we are talking about, we we'll probably we look, you know, we couldn't we think uh, of this stuff? I I would say that I don't want to answer that question. I ex <laughs> express it. I would say I think what we will see will be major uh, innovations using mobile technologies and applications that we cannot think of now, but they will be driven by uh, constraints that people are facing uh, day to day, whether it is in their operations, uh, whether it's where the government is failing, where the uh, markets are failing. I think there will be solutions, and these young people in this innovation lab are doing, are looking at particular constraints in, in operations and trying to see what's the s solutions they can do. So uh, I would say that there would be geometric explosion of, of solutions using mobile technologies uh, in the private sector. But I, th I think in governance also, there will be major changes in how w our governments relate to us as citizens I in Africa especially. Uh, and I, just to give you a simple example, in, in one of the big problems we have in service delivery is that people don't show up. Uh, doctors don't show up, teachers don't show up. Yeah. So we do surveys, we find that we have about 20 to 25 percent in a single day of t teachers are not in a classroom. The monitoring is weak. Now we are doing a system where we are getting reports on a daily basis in some sample schools of teacher absenteeism without necessarily going to do the random checks. But someone, we sele select about how schools and we get uh, information about teacher absenteeism. The moment they know that this can happen, it will be very difficult for them to do that. This is the same in terms of, they tell us now, if you want to get a, a passport, uh, this is what you expect to get and so on. So I think there will be major reforms because of uh, the mobile technologies, but predicting ahead, we can just say it will just be a major uh, explosion. And, and a good sign is what I saw now in terms of the new investment of innovation laboratories in the universities, in private sector, Equity Bank, I, I served as a director of Equity Bank at one point for six years, and now they have about 100 innovation centers uh, for, for, for mobile-based applications, where they are giving people, allowing people so that they can see how to, to move on this. So I, I think we, we expect great things from this. Okay, uh, let's open the floor to uh, questions from the uh, audience. So if you can uh, raise your hand, we have uh, individuals with uh, microphones. Uh, there's your question right there on the aisle. So if you could uh, give us your uh, name and your uh, organization, uh, we, we would ask you to keep your questions brief so we can get to as many people as possible. Sure. Uh, Michael Castle Miller with the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned as uh, money transfers uh, took off in uh, Kenya, they faced all the opposition from banking industry. I'm wondering, as entrepreneurs begin to spread into these other industries that you were talking about, do you also anticipate now, um, you know, opposition from government, entrenched interests, to to those uh, new industries? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer? Uh, actually, you know, in the end, what happened is that uh, after they lost this fight, they decided they have to find a way of getting into the market. So right now, every bank has combined so that now they have linked up to the, to the, to the mobile transfer system. So now they are collaborating with the, with the, with the transfer system, uh, with the, with the, with the M-Pesa. So if you go to uh, Barclays or Cooperative Bank or Equity, you can be able to do transactions uh, directly between the accounts and PESA. And so they are, they are cooperating. Now, there, there is an issue in Kenya that is also important, and this is something that we need to explore. Now, uh, Safaricom has a market share which keeps on coming by the others. All the others are always complaining. Market share is about uh, maybe 60% of the market in terms of, 70% in terms of uh, uh, subscribers, in terms of the phone uh, communication but about 85% of the mobile transfers. So that is really dominant. And what's happened is that every business person, because they don't want to handle cash, these are, you know, they are risk carrying, carrying money. So even all these other people are now joining in, in terms of now, it's a, actually a currency. It's an accepted currency. Uh, so entrepreneurs are all finding ways to join into this uh, transfer at this point. Uh, I think it's so dominant that it's difficult to, to, to fight it. Rather than fighting it, is fighting how do I get into this uh, business? Okay, uh, Christine has a question from 
Oh, you don't have a question. Uh, Stephanie, who's right back there, yeah, okay. Yes, we have a question from the Project, and they want to know, to the entire panel, they're asking, how can you strengthen the rule of law through innovative mobile technologies? Don't everyone <laughs> speak at once. <laughs> well, I, I, let me just say, I, I think that um, you know, the rule of law, um, you can approach it from a lot of directions. It's not something I've thought too deeply about, but I think it's fundamentally rule of law. There's an, a very important piece of accountability um, of, of people, uh, whether they're private sector actors, government actors, uh, social sector, education, uh, and it's building in that accountability. And I mean, imagine, just to take this, the example from Kenya, and I was reading Dean Carlin's a new book, um, which I, I reviewed and I really liked, um, from Innovation for Poverty Action, and one of the things is they just, they lined up students um, in, uh, in schools to just take a short video every day at the same time of, the, of where the teacher should be standing. Mm -hmm and either the teacher was there or not there, and then they would upload that, um, and, then, and then officials in, uh, you know, who had oversight responsibility could see it five minutes later whether the teacher was actually showing up or not. And so well, I'm glad we don't do that at Brookings. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I think that accountability on all levels and, um, uh, you, know, and you know, all the stakeholders in making the market uh, and, uh, and work um, become much more affordable as people get um, comfortable uh, and I think the comfort level is of people with their phones and the various capabilities. The phone prices are dropping. The comfort level of using more of the, the video and, and image capture and data capture parts of it is growing. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is geometrically increasing. What's going to be here in three years? I mean, I'm wanting to almost, uh, the, the pace of change is so fast, I'm almost wanting to, make some line about bayonets and horses, but I, <laughs> but I can't quite figure out what it is. So I'll, um, but, uh, but anyway, the, the rule of law and how it, and how it relates to uh, keeping people accountable um, for doing what they should be doing and not doing what they're not doing, uh, boy, the, the phone is, I think, a, just a powerful tool that we're just starting to see the, 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 the faint beginnings of. Brooke, any? Sorry, sure. Um, I think fundamentally it's great to think about the mobile phone as enabling two things, information and interaction, right? Those are the two things that it really enables. So from an information perspective, the amount of data that's being collected through mobile phones around the world has vast implications. The whole concept of big data and how that's being used can be applied very much to the process of setting policy and, 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 and really creating an environment that is um, uh, more beneficial for one's citizens. It also allows for interaction, and that brings up for me the topic of um, what many refer to as digital citizenship, and the opportunity through the cell phone to bring people who are otherwise, for instance, in the informal economy or just completely sort of uh, excluded from society in many ways into society or into the formal economy. And, and that has fundamental implications for rule of law, for economic growth for many aspects of societal growth. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like uh, to Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's mentioned a lot, I agree with all these uh, issues of uh, uh, accountability are uh, key uh, information. The way I've seen, and, and you mentioned this in your, in, your, in your paper about empowerment, although you talk about uh, women and poor, but actually what mobile phones have done is really give a lot of people power. They know that uh, they can communicate with people they could not otherwise communicate. Uh, they can send messages to the state house. They can send messages to the radio station, and they can actually uh, say what's going on in their community, whether they are, they are, they are what, whatever services they may, they may be getting, and so on. So I think the the the, the issue of uh, uh, rule of law uh, through this accountability chain is going to be strengthened in terms of looking at the you know the, the relationship between the citizens and the and the and their. Uh, their politicians and, and, and the, the administrators and so on. So uh, it will be, it's a major issue. It's a way, the other way of looking at how social media uh, had the impact in terms of the um, Arab Spring. I don't think we'll get that movement type in, uh, in Africa. We don't have all that like real internet access and uh, being able to, to communicate, although it's happening in the cities, but mobile phones will do the, can do the same, uh, 
the same, the same uh, can come up with the same uh, changes. Okay, in the very back is a JAMA, the question. Uh, hi, Bill Jorn uh, with a company called ROI3. And uh, thank you, Daryl, for organizing these. You know I've been at many of your sessions. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of our company is to build apps for the emerging and developing marketplace. And I say that only as a preface to the question. The references that you all have made are to countries, by and large. Are there practical opportunities for developing apps, not only on a country basis, but on a regional, like an ECOWAS in West Africa, uh, or even on a continental, global basis? Can I, uh, th let me respond to that because I know the practical cases of, uh, now, for example, Airtel. Airtel is uh, whatever you can do in one country, you can do in, uh, you know, it's, it's all, I think it's the entire Africa now. Uh, and uh, you can do uh, a lot of things using the same platforms. In the case of Safaricom and Vodafone in, uh, in uh, East Africa, uh, for example, in the case of money transfers, it, do it doesn't matter you, with where you are. You can do all those in any of those countries. Uh, but I think th uh, the problems that have been, uh, where they have, they have specific problems have been done by local entrepreneurs, and they've been focusing more on the problems that they face. So I think that's a good opportunity in terms of thinking about uh, broader uh, issues. Although I know, for example, in the case of one, one interesting one is where you have this uh, transport, uh, like from Mombasa to, to, to Kigali in Rwanda, where they've been having a lot of problems with theft and, uh, and drivers, uh, you know, using the trucks for other purposes, where now there's a tracking system uh, using mobile devices that they know, the owners will know exactly where they are. It's combining with the GPS and the phone. Uh, and they are supposed to report every time and they know where they are. So there could be. Yeah. Just in, in terms of uh, we're now starting to confront this as we take our community knowledge worker model in a, in a little more um, different form to places like Ghana, Tanzania, and Colombia. Um, and I think certain things such as, you know, it's, it was kind of a revelation for me that one of the things that farmers in Uganda most wanted were basically f accurate weather reports. Uh, you know, three days in advance, which were available, but you just needed an interface like we all have on our iPhones, or, um, but on a more, make it more on a, on, a, on a more basic phone to get that available. I think some of that is probably scalable across regions pretty easily. Other things, uh, less so. Um, you know, how we develop this database of agricultural information for Uganda, in addition to the price things, which obviously fluctuate, is we just went through a painstaking process of finding the thousand questions that Ugandan farmers most asked, most wanted answers to, and then went to all the agricultural authorities there and said, what are the best answers? They're really relevant to not telling them to you know, buy some fertilizer that's only available in Belgium, but what, what's actually what they can do in their own. And when we look to see transferring that database of questions and answers, uh, you might say frequently asked questions, from Uganda to Kenya, there's a lot that's transferable and a lot that needs to be re-engineered. Not the underlying technology, um, but in fact the, you know, the, the, the content that populates that does really change and, and even in some cases what the most, you know, uh, you know, some of the questions there are much more relevant to certain parts of Uganda than the others. Um, so uh, so it's, I think it varies, uh, but I think looking for things that are apps that are scalable across regions and even globally, there probably will be some. Uh, and some of them will really need to be localized even within a country. Uh, right there in the aisle, there's a question. Hi, Teresa Trusty. I'm a fellow at uh, USAID working in the Mobile Solutions Group. And my question um, relates to the issues of scale, lack of interoperability, and the plethora of solutions that are out there. What concrete steps can the various actors in this space take to address these challenging issues? I think, and this also refers back to the previous question, there are a couple ways to scale applications. You can, you can scale by taking one implementation and making it cross-country, cross-border, or you can replicate an application in various different places, achieving scale but through, through, through smaller implementations. We actually have found that the first approach doesn't work, and it doesn't work because um, because every time you cross borders, you're dealing with different regulations, you're dealing with different network uh, operators, you're, everything, so many aspects change, including the content, as Alex was referring to as well. 
And so, um, so in terms of scale for applications across borders or going regionally, applications obviously there's need for uh, M-Pesa-like services, you know, in in most developing countries, but but replicating through. Um, many different implementations is really the way that, that we see that happening in the near term because you're dealing with so many regulatory issues. If you also look at, for instance, you know, financial services or health, you're going into a country and you're dealing actually with two new sets of regulatory bodies because you're dealing with technology regulation and the, the tech telecommunications industry in that country, and you're also dealing with the industry regulations, whether it's health or financial services, and that's gonna change from country to country. So it's difficult to scale beyond borders without creating a whole new implementation. Just if I could add, I, I think what we need to do, frankly, to, to use a technical term is get our act together. Um, meaning this, and we all are to blame by these one-off solutions. Uh, um, but I think there's some progress, and, I'm, and I, I, I've seen it most for, for our involvement with our uh, MoTeC, Mobile Technology for Community Health in Ghana, which USAID has been an important supporter of, where, to make a long story short, um, and with, our, with a real important role from the Gates Foundation that has funded a lot of these one-off solutions have, have basically said that when we executed this mobile midwife program in Ghana, we executed the basic program well, but we were fortunate enough to get the right software engineers to build the underlying platform for this database that sends messages to, you know, to um, pregnant women and throughout, you know, that they're useful information for them and creates a database where the health workers can track their progress. In fact, it's basically mobile medical records, you know, more advancing more quickly there than here uh, as part of this project. Um, and they said the underlying technology that we did they thought was the best of any M Health, uh, and they thought that there were two others that had done certain aspects of it better than we did. And so we're now combining these three platforms into a single uh, kind of platform for mobile health, and then the Gates Foundation is doing its part to encourage existing and new mobile health uh, programs not to reinvent the wheel, but to operate off of this kind of tripartite platform that we're uh, that we're uh, uh, working to develop. Again, based on just the, what we we're kind of re-engineering what was just built for a specific project in Ghana as a kind of generic uh, open source tool. Uh, and so I think that across other domains in the in the mobile space, uh, this kind of coopetition, developing you know uh, common standards figuring out really who's got the, the underlying technology right and others building on it uh, and uh, you know, applying the open source kind of principles. Uh, I think that you know, it's, it's time for us to, especially those of us that are do, you know, trying to do this for, with philanthropic capital for social goals, you know, we can't afford the costs of unnecessary duplication. Uh, Stephanie has another question from our web audience. Yes, I have a question from Jonathan Alger, who's watching from London, and he's asking on the financial side of this, the financial scaling up, what's the condition of venture capitalism in Africa? Are investors in the Global North paying attention? So, um, I think uh, Africa has changed a lot the last 10 years uh, in terms of uh, openness. And uh, it, uh, us here, particularly my unit, has been uh, uh, saying that uh, I think the United States maybe has ignored Africa in terms of the opportunities, while many other countries have realized a lot of opportunities. So they are always going there uh, in terms of trying to get into the banking. And of course, when you think about some of these, uh, uh, when you think about most of the, like, like uh, Safaricom. Safaricom is about uh, maybe, you know, 60% is Vodafone, which is a UK based uh, company, so there, and uh, Airtel is India, uh, so um, there are few local ones, but most of these companies have uh, ownership uh, uh, from outside, so there's quite a bit of uh, I interest in that, and new ones uh, are coming, but not just that, I mean there's, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, now new, uh, you know, uh, banking, investment banks that are going into these issues of venture capital. Uh, risk-taking uh, particular activities, and I know that some of the innovation hubs are also uh, funded through venture capital, where they have seen some promising ideas and they have put some money. So I think this is uh, going to be uh, be more. Uh, government, African governments have also to change to make sure that uh, one is that um, 
uh, the environment for business is good, uh, repatriation of profits, there are no constraints, the tax uh, simplification issues. So there are a lot of issues on the African side, but uh, they, are, they, are, they are changing. If you look at uh, like the, the measures of uh, doing business in Africa, Africa has been leading in terms of improvements, not level, but improvements over the last few years. So. Can I quick addition to that? Our, we're in Silicon Valley. Our offices are right by Sand Hill, where all the VCs are in, in, in that part of the world. And we've had lots of conversations with them about you know, their investments in emerging markets. And, and the challenge for them is their, their investments are already high risk, and they're OK with that, right? Investing in technology and large tech growth opportunities is risky. When you add to that the risk of going to a very unfamiliar market with very unfamiliar and often volatile conditions, it's just, it, it gets to a risk profile that they're not comfortable with. So it, for the most part, the VC community, at least in Silicon Valley at this point, um, has started establishing offices in the BRIC countries where they're feeling more comfortable and they have more familiarity now. But in looking at, you know, sort of the next level emerging markets, they're still, from what we can tell, a level of discomfort in terms of the risk profile overall. Yeah, and I think there it may also be an element of kind of fads and phases. I think the, the venture capitalists the, have certainly taken on the issue of the uh, of kind of climate change and the driving technology to address climate change and energy efficiency with their investing. I think on the kind of mobile solutions to address poverty and entrepreneurship, that's probably more been done either indirectly uh, or as a philanthropic play. Um, but that may change or it may be based on the fact that how, you know, the climate change is going to affect us much more directly uh, or is at least perceived to be than poverty and, and uh, uh, and uh, even the, you know, the rising kind of uh, entrepreneurs of the developing world. It may be based on that the technology itself is changing so rapidly that people wonder where to place their bets. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I, I think, uh, but I would hope, I think it would be very uh, constructive if that same approach that the, the, uh, some of the venture capital community has taken to the uh, kind of clean energy and renewable energy would come into uh, this space, I think it would be very healthy. And, and sorry if I may, sorry. that said, um, if while the, the traditional VC community is slower in that direction, large multinational technology yeah. companies, for instance, are making huge investments yeah. in their growth in emerging markets. Qualcomm is one of the sponsors of, of, of this event. Um, Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, all of them making enormous investments in in not just growing their own business in emerging markets, but in helping to develop the entrepreneurial ecosystem in developing countries because they know that's good for their business, right? And so it's, a, it's an important um, part of the development of entrepreneurship in developing countries. And of course, mobile plays a huge role on many levels in yeah. those activities. Okay, so we have a question up here in the front row. Um, Femi Akibi, I'm from Nigeria. Uh, my question is, is there any application or how far are we, how close are we to an application that could translate all the dialects into a simple language? In other words, you send something in English, immediately could be translated to 540 different dialects. Uh, secondly, in area of election and voting, how do we get to do this to identify people so that if there's a infrastructural or logistic constraint, they are known for who they are, and they can vote. Uh, in a place like Nigeria, for example, where the police department lack a lot of communication equipment, the walkie-talkie from the cell phone could become a very good communication device, and so also to track the police uh, location. In Nigeria, for example, there are establishments that use the federal police department for private hotel security, I'm talking 50, 60 of them, and they've been there for years. With this kind of application, we could take a picture of it, send it to the uh, necessary authority to see how uh, they can address it. And uh, lastly, in area of education, is there any way we are able to use this to enhance uh, the African-based education from an African or continental angle. Thank you. Okay. Good questions. Panel. Uh, um, I don't know about the translations. I haven't seen this. Is a technical question. 
I know that um, in many parts now you get, uh, you can choose a service like in Swahili, in, if you're in the East African region, you can, you can do your transactions in Swahili. But uh, I think this is a technical one and um, it's, it's more the technical side. Um, so, but I haven't seen that uh, translation. I, I just comment on the issue of the elections uh, because I think it's very important uh, and uh, what uh, is on the ground now for many countries that are holding, uh, you know, maybe scheduled to hold elections the, the, next, the next few months uh, is that they are the use of mobile uh, phones and uh, mobile-based technology in terms of transmission of data, in terms of reporting and so on will be very important. I know it's in place, um, particularly in the Kenyan case where a lot of people are observing this, I know there are already uh, plans in the ground of how this will be coordinated. Uh, as I mentioned, the issues of violence, issues of um, you know where there are issue, you know maybe uh, uh, people stealing the votes and so on. So all that is, seems to be in place. But uh, overall, governance, governance improvements do will not come from incumbent governments. In my observation, Nigerian government may not actually want on its own to make improvements on governance to make things more transparent because that doesn't necessarily mean that it improves its chances. I think when, so transparency is usually gonna come from the people pushing for, for this. It's not the government to sit down and say, oh, now we want to be more honest uh, with, uh, with the people. Uh, so I think it has to come to, from, the, uh, from the people. So the question is, how do, could mobile technology be more effective? How can we use them to uh, empower the people. I think that was one of the issues. How can we empower the citizen so that they can actually push their, their governments more uh, to be more accountable? Mm. Yeah, Alex? Just um, on the translation, I, I really don't know the state of, uh, of it, although it seems to be improving. My, my uh, assumption uh, is that the, um, is that what's gonna, the market is going to deliver our translation and through voice recognition and so forth for the language is spoken by the wealthiest billion or two billion people in the world. That's what the market will deliver. But I think piggybacking on that, those approaches, and this may be an appropriate role for philanthropy, uh, is, to, is to piggyback on that and do that for some of the languages that are dominantly spoken by people and more in the, in the base of the pyramid. And I, would, I think that'll, that won't happen automatically. I think it will take a, a, a concerted effort. Um, on the education side, the, you know, one experience we've had operating off of this, this MoTeC platform designed for health, um, we've started a partnership with the BBC uh, in India, but that I think could be, will be applied to Africa, which is allowing uh, frontline healthcare workers to take a kind of distance learning course on their mobile phone um, around best practices in, in, in their field and a kind of continuing education. And the uptake, I mean, we had 32,000 frontline health workers in Bihar sign up in the first six weeks. Um, and, uh, and again, very critical part, uh, cultural, uh, you got to deliver the certificates, uh, which are actually need to be real certificates uh, uh, that people can have. They're very important in a lot of the countries that we've worked in. But if you can get those, uh, those kind of cultural things right and then deliver good content uh, with a good brand of kind of Grameen partnering with BBC, um, I think there's a, a huge opportunities for continuing education um, across the mobile phone uh, for people that are actually in, um, that are working uh, in, um, whether they're doing it on the corporate side or the governmental side or the non-governmental side. Uh, I think there's a whole other play in terms of distance learning for people that are in school and I don't know how far off it is that a, a you know, girl sitting in, a, in you know, a Zambia can get a Harvard degree. Uh, uh, and, uh, and all that, whether that's really 10 or 15 years off or that's closer, I don't know. But the continuing ed education piece, uh, we've certainly seen uh, enormous interest in, in this pilot that is we've done in India. Uh, in the very back, there's a question. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Yaya Fenusi. I'm with United States of Africa 2017 project. I listen to you guys and I see that you're beating about the bush on a certain aspect when you were talking about scales and barriers, etc. What you're facing now in expanding investment and entrepreneurship is what the people in Africa for the last 50 years, some of us have been saying, that these existing states are not viable to provide the needs of the people. 
and now you're facing it in terms of entrepreneurship and economic development and things like that. And we know when one's capital wants to get its way, it will make sure what we are advocating for so many years, that there should be a federation in Africa, it will happen. Venture capitalists in Silicon Valley will be flooding in five years when we have the federation. Mm -hmm. It's a bold prediction. <laughs> I'm Mitzi Wirth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. The most recent issue of Time Magazine is raising questions about colleges. And I will, it was very critical of online learning. They did a study, it's a, it's a question of content and how it's presented. And one of the schools did it not just having a straight lecture, but based on kind of how the, how the brain works. Mm. And so it, I think this is gonna eventually be good, but not basically in the volume that it's gonna be offered. On the outset, I wanna raise another question about satellite information and the dependence on US satellites and whether or not you think the entrepreneurial world is gonna get more satellites up. I heard a discussion last week from someone from NOAA who was talking about the lack of interest of, Amer of the American voter in replacing the satellites that are up there. And th their answer is, why do we need to worry about that? We have the weather channel. And so there's this question of people understanding all the piece parts that are needed. And I, I have no idea what your thoughts are on, on satellites and how this fits into your discussions. I'd be happy to make a comment on the satellites uh, it, it, in the context of agriculture and, and, and entrepreneurship related within the realm of agriculture. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now about how digital technology, especially digital, digital technology that's being used more, more pervasively in the developed world can be applied in developing countries for better productivity of agriculture, which of course all centers back in on the individual farmer or the smallholder farmer who I would qualify as an entrepreneur in many ways. And so there is um, new and innovative work going on to use satellite data to better inform farmers on how to increase their productivity um, by using their land better, by using the right fertilizers and doing so at a very sort of micro level. It's, it's, it's um, in early stages right now. Um, uh, certain countries like Brazil have done some really interesting work at the national level, but I think it's something for you to keep your eye on, and you'll see so it connecting in. Getting satellites up there, so so you can actually do all the things. There's a concern mm -hmm. at certain level governments, I mean certain levels of government here, that we're, we don't have the public support to get the satellites up when you're going around cutting budgets. So. All I'm suggesting is some people have to start paying attention to that or all of a sudden you're gonna discover the things you're capable of doing. If you get the information, we may not be able to provide the bandwidth or whatever. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Oh. Oh, Just to, uh, I mean, first of all, my basic assumption without tracking satellite launch patterns and, and so forth is that you know, if, people, if people can make money off of it, putting those satellites up to serve the wealthiest billion people in the world, it'll happen. Uh, and if governments don't stop it, and then the question is how can we piggyback on that, on what is going to happen or not happen, serving them to benefit the, the base of the pyramid. And I think that's the play and that's the trends we need to uh, watch. On the education piece, what you mentioned first, it, it, uh, I've actually read a very small amount of that Time Magazine article. I, it's, on the, it's on my dresser, but one thing that was interesting is they talk about, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they talk about different learning styles of different cultures, and uh, and and it was really really a fascinating kind of summary in a very short number of words of four different cultures, and so I think that that's right. I think in, in terms of this distance learning, e-learning has <clears throat> got to come over that. Uh, at the same time, I think that in certain sectors like the healthcare sector, where there's a certain common culture that cuts across and learning styles within the healthcare industry, uh, and that doing uh, and that the, the content and how people learn, may there may be more similarities than in just a kind of generic undergraduate education. Um, but you know, this is, uh, this is hard work, right? So just one little piece in our mobile midwife program um, where we were delivering these messages 
uh, to uh, pregnant women about what they should do at week this and week that. Um, and we, you know, we feel very proud of it because you know, I was worried that this would be just seen as like junk mail, the voicemail or SMSs, and yet two thirds of the women not only listen to the message, but do a prompt for a supplemental message. And half of them get a third message. It's just like an optional add-on message. But you know, we thought most of them would want those messages through SMS. Turns out 99% wanted voicemail, um, a voice message. And then testing whose voice would they listen to. So we tried male voices, female voices, educated voices, a little more kind of undereducated, you know, kind of the common man voice or common woman, uh, this dialect, that dialect. And you know, we finally got it that it was a, that someone that sounded like someone's kind of, kind of kindly auntie who had a certain amount of you know, high school education, but not more, not less, and that people responded a lot better to those messages um, than all the other options. And that, you know, and you think, oh, just got information, you got a technology, you sign some people up. Um, it, it's hard work. So I, I just want to comment on planning, uh, but going back to mobile technologies, I know that there are several cases where uh, banks are using this learning, but training people in terms of basic entrepreneurship skills, bookkeeping, mm -hmm. and, and you know, just record keeping and so on, and they do it, but uh, with expectation that they now can go to the bank and apply for a loan, they will answer questions, and, uh, and so this is working, and th many of them seem to be taking on, you know, like how do you repay the loans, uh, you know, go through that, and that seems to be working. Uh, and it's, it's free, it's offered by some banks, and then you go and apply for, the, for their own. So it's, there could be some uh, applications that one. So we have time for one last question, and I'm gonna ask it. Uh, <laughs> the role of women and the impact of uh, women. Uh, there have been some studies suggesting that uh, mobile devices are a big empower of women in particular, uh, just because in many uh, countries they face uh, various types of uh, barriers. So I'm just curious, what our panel uh, thinks, uh, particularly in terms of how all this affects women. Mm. I'm happy to comment. Um, we did a study on women and mobiles a couple years ago for the GSM Association and for the Cherie Blair Foundation for Women. And we did, we did very in-depth quantitative research in four emerging market countries. And what, we, what came out of that is um, a, a, a pretty significant gender gap in terms of mobile phone ownership in developing countries. At least at the time we did the research, there were 300 million fewer women owning cell phones than men. Um, and um, when, you, when you look at uh, other aspects of these markets, for instance, we know that in many countries, women are responsible for up to 80% of mm -hmm. food production in the country. And yet they're also the primary caregiver in the home. So if someone gets sick at home, they're pulled out of the fields, which means that their productivity goes down. They're also um, in need of, of health care and health support that they're not able to get. So the cell phone can help them on so many levels in terms of their actual productivity and revenue generation, in terms of their ability to provide effective health care in the home and maximize just the overall workings of their home and their own, their own business. Mm. Um, we did find, however, that um, that most women did not have cell phones because they didn't see a need for it. They, they actually didn't see how it was going to be helping them. And what we uh, surmised from that is that while their, their lives, their worlds were rel relatively small and they had immediate access to most of the people that they needed to talk to, they had not yet experienced the value of, of services that can go beyond just talking to your neighbor or being in contact with your, with your husband or your family members. And so as value-added services are, are becoming more available, for instance, one of the countries where we did the research was in Kenya, where M-Pesa was much more available and everyone was aware of the different types of value-added services. The women in Kenya actually understood the value of the cell phone much better than the women in the other countries where we, we did the research, where fewer value-added services were available. So public education does help. I, I think uh, basically, it, once once uh, women get the, the phones, I think there is actually more utility uh, in terms of uh, what they can get out of it, the information, relevance, health, agriculture, because they are in particular far away in the rural areas, many of, many of the women. But I can say that adoption rates uh, in uh, particular, looking at Kenya, adoption rates in Kenya may not be that different between men and women. In fact, uh, they may be very close. I mean, I. 
I, I talked to people at the eight, uh, my, my mother passed away a few years ago at eight or seven. She knew a lot of things I didn't know about the mobile applications. <laughs> they knew how to withdraw money. That's one of the things they, they get to know even at that age. So um, even, uh, I think it's very wide, wide, but in terms of empowerment, I think it's a very important tool. Uh, um, uh, we know that um, we are, by the way, a lot of questions were scaling up and all that is that we have a lot of, because we, are, we do research, we are doing these small scale pilots, uh, trying to see what works and what we would not. And so we are trying to do a lot of things and see how it, this, this happens. We have one that we are trying on violence, uh, and violence in terms of um, uh, male, female, uh, domestic violence, to see whether uh, having mobile phones. Uh, with men, some of them giving them mobile phones and asking them to report uh, any potential or, or incidences. And it's very small scale because we haven't even gone to the full pilot. But the idea there is that we expect that having a mobile phone is a major uh, tool. They can report without even the husband knowing. People can come. Uh, and I think that's their work. So I think it is, it's, a, it's an important tool for empowerment. We need just need to see how to get them uh, more involved. Okay, hey, Alex, we'll give you the last word on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I think that there is a, will be a tendency for women's adoption of, and benefit from these technologies to lag, all things being equal. And I, I think that looking for some strategic ways to close that gap or eliminate that gap um, would be important. Uh, one of which is, uh, I think, and this is why we've, one of the reasons we've um, been focusing on both mobile for development and microfinance is that microfinance is a huge uh, infrastructure uh, that has been dominated by interfacing with women clients uh, in, up till now dealing with the currency of money but also can now deal with the currency of in, in information and connectivity. So piggybacking on that, using that a channel to market, to sensitize um, uh, and to give people familiarity I think is an important play and uh, using that infrastructure. Second of all, I think just developing applications that are, that are you know, oriented to the issues that women care about. Uh, the mobile midwife program in Ghana, not surprisingly, we found that when you went down the socioeconomic ladder, the likelihood that a woman uh, would have her own phone or even that her family would or her community would went down. It was surprisingly you know, a lot, you know, lot, but still, the poorer you got, the less likely. Well, by having an application like a mobile midwife program that, again, we were through with MTN and other partners we can deliver for free, at least for now, um, that that actually sp seems to be spurring women getting their own phones because the men are, you know, th these messages that come about, you know, that aren't relevant to them, you know, it's a hassle for them. So, um, or, uh, or at least the woman having more access to it and more familiarity with it. So there's an, kind of an apps development angle uh, in terms of with a kind of a, a woman lens. And then, um, you know, lastly, I think that this idea of empowering the poor themselves to become the kind of enumerators, the monitoring and evalu evaluation arm of the international development sector uh, is very powerful because I think we make a lot of assumptions that are frankly wrong uh, because we don't have real-time gender disaggregated data on how th what, what's working and what's not. Um, and by having that data, uh, I think we can actually lead to a much uh, better decision making, better public policies. Of course, you know, better information doesn't always lead to better public policies, as uh, uh, you know, uh, it happens in a couple of countries around the world. But uh, but it, it it leads to the possibility of it. Uh, and then with the free media, which is I think more and more common, I think there's some uh, there's some powerful synergies. So again, I, I think it, it will take a combination of market forces and a kind of public interest. Uh, you know, work on behalf of the poor, on behalf of women to piggyback on these lar much larger trends that we don't have control of, but how do you, uh, cr you know, create pro-poor and pro-women outcomes, and, and that's going to be the work that we're going to be doing, and it seems like a lot of you are going to be doing in the years ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Alex, uh, Mwangi, and Brooke for sharing your insights with us, and thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.